Hey guys, uh, this is video one. Um, we're going to be talking about parts of the experiment and characteristics of life. Um, this is the first podcast in our flipped classroom experiment, so I hope it works. All right, so we're going to talk about parts of experiment. And parts of experiment, there are basically two basic parts. Uh, first, there's the control group. The control group is the one that stays the same, the one that does not change, the one that you use to compare all your results to. And then you have the experimental group. The experimental group is basically sometimes called the variable group and it's broken up into two things either an independent variable or a dependent variable now the independent variable is the variable is the variable that is changed in the experiment the dependent variable depends on the change so let me give you an example if i had a twin brother and we both did exactly the same activities uh, we laid around each day and watched espn um, we didn't do anything differently at all and one of us chose to change our eating habits. The one that didn't change their eating habits would be the control. The other one that changed the eating habits would be the experimental group. Now let's say that I was the one who changed my eating habits and I decided to eat a Big Mac for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day, uh, do no exercise. Uh, my brother chose to do, do no exercise either to keep the control the same. But at the end of our experiment, the independent variable would be the Big Mac what we changed, how we ate differently, and the dependent variable would be, of course, my weight. All right, let me give you another example. Here's a plant that they show day one, and both plants look alike. One is going to have purified water, one is going to have microwave water. Now, the purified water over here, this one, is actually your control. So this is your experimental plant the one you're going to add microwave water to. So now what is microwave water? Microwave water is our independent variable. Because the only thing that's changed about this experiment, they both have exactly the same soil, they have the same type of plant, basically the same height, they're sitting in the same window, uh, so everything's pretty much the same except for that microwave water. So that's our independent variable. Now, after day on day nine, we can make look at the experiment, and if you look, the plant with the microwave water has died. The one with the purified water is still growing. So our dependent variable in this experiment would be the growth or height of the plant. And as we can tell, we, purified water is a lot better for the plant than. Uh, microwave water but this would be a classic example so be able to do that on test in case I give you an experiment be able to identify the control the experimental the dependent and independent variables now a next theme in biology is called the nature of biology and it's basically dealing with ethics ethics is the study of what is right and wrong it basically prevents scientists from crossing the line and doing things they shouldn't do uh, I'll give you an example uh, smallpox was a disease that you know plagued the earth for many years and it caused a lot of deaths uh, there was a scientist who had a hypothesis. He noticed that there were ladies within villages that had cowpox. Now, cowpox, you get it from, uh, if you milk cows for a living, so it's a long time ago. If you milk cows for a living, you get cowpox. It looks very similar to smallpox, and to give you an idea of what smallpox and cowpox looks like, it's kind of like our chicken pox. We get sores on your body, and the disease can be passed from person to person, by the fluids, the bodily fluids being in contact with another person. Well, the scientists had a hypothesis that if you got cowpox, it made you immune to smallpox. So what he did, he did something very unethical. He took a little boy, and he went to some cow maiden who had cowpox, and he gave the little boy cowpox. The boy was sick for a few days, for a few weeks. He got better. And then he carried him to a cemetery where someone had died from smallpox. He infected the little boy with smallpox. And, you know, if he had been incorrect about his conclusion or about his hypothesis, then the little boy would have died. Very unethical. But luckily for him and luckily for the little boy, uh, he was right. Cowpox actually did make you immune to... I mean, excuse me, cowpox actually did make you immune to smallpox because it was so similar. Um... Well, he invented the first vaccinations as a result very quickly. So ethics does slow science down sometimes, but we've got to have it. It makes things 
uh, and make scientists keep from crossing, crossing the line. You know, I mean, it's going to come into play in our century uh, with cloning issue. You know, how do we determine um, when it's right to clone someone or when it's, you know, how does that all work out? Are we playing God or, or what? So ethics is going to come into play more and more through your lifetime. Now, the last thing we need to cover are characteristics of living things. Now, your book breaks it down into eight different characteristics, and if you were to list those on the test, I'd be totally fine with it. But for I usually group them into four categories. Now, the thing you need to understand about characteristics of living things, uh, in order for something to be classified as living, it has to have all four of these characteristics. If something has three of them, then it it's not, does not work. So let's look at the first characteristic. The first characteristic is it has to have an orderly structure. You know, usually you think of a living thing having cells or even being composed of DNA. Here's a double helix structure of DNA, very orderly, how the phosphates are always on the outside, the nitrogen bases are always on the inside, the sugars create the backbone. Um, this has to have an orderly structure. So all living things have to be orderly in some way. Uh, the second thing is they have to be able to reproduce. Now, does, does this mean that if you don't have kids, that you're not a living thing, this does not mean that. Does it mean that if you do not have the ability to reproduce, are you not a living thing? It does not mean that as either. Um, as you see the line here, it's not essential for an individual to reproduce, but it's essential for the species to reproduce as a whole in order to be able to propagate or to keep the species going, to keep from coming extinct. So reproduction is a big key. You know, and I give you some examples here, you know, like the, the fish lays eggs and the little baby fish and the hen, you know, mother, father. So have to, living things have to reproduce in order to be classified as, some, as being living. Uh, the third thing is they have to grow and develop. You know, in human beings, that's adolescence. Human beings go from crawling to walking. You know, uh, boys have a deeper voice. Girls get curves. Um, you know, you think about in trees or plants, they start to produce fruit or they get taller. Organisms have to grow and develop through time, All right, often controlled by hormones. The fourth characteristic is probably the most difficult one, and it's probably the thing that differentiates things from living and non-living most often times, and that it must adjust to its environment or it will die. And we call that maintaining a homeostasis. Now, you really need to know what this word homeostasis means. So really log it down. You're going to see this many, many, many times during the semester. A homeostasis means to maintain a balance. Um, an example would be breathing heavy, sweating with exercising. So let me, give you, let me show you. If, if I were to ask someone to run up the road to the stoplight and back, when they got back, there would be signs that show me that they, their body is trying to maintain that homeostasis. Your body wants to stay at 98.6 degrees, but if it gets above it, your body has to cool, cool itself down to try to maintain that balance. One way it does it is by sweating. You, you also have a decrease in oxygen level and increase in carbon dioxide level in your body. So your body has to eliminate the carbon dioxide and get in oxygen, so you start breathing harder and your heart starts to beating faster. So that's trying to maintain that homeostasis balance. You know, same thing, if, if I were to drop someone off in Antarctica, um, you know, their body would try to maintain that 98.6 degrees even as the temperature started to get colder and colder. Uh, how would they do this? They would develop goose pumps. Um, hair would stand up on their, stand straight up trying to create a layer of insulation. Um, their body would cut off blood flow to unimportant areas, your legs, your fingers, and focus it in on your chest and your heart and your lungs and your brain. Um, so your body always tries to maintain a homeostasis. So this is what separates living things from non-living things. You know, you can even go into cats. Cats shed their fur in the summertime. They, they increase their fur in the wintertime, etc. All right, I hope this helps, and um, I hope video one is enjoyable for you. Um, you can refer to it back often, and we'll see you in video two. All right, you guys have a good day. Bye.